Today we're going to be talking about mechanics and I think a good way to start this video is to define what mechanics actually is. Mechanics is the ability to successfully execute a play. This could be a good play or a bad play but how well it is actually executed comes down to mechanics. Some may even define mechanics as clicking speed or clicking accuracy. However, I think this definition may be harmful and today I want to talk about how I see the concept of mechanics and perhaps a more healthy way of viewing mechanics. So mechanics is typically viewed synonymously with micro in the classic micro versus macro for gaming. Macro is the planning, the strategizing, the forming a decision, and micro is the actual execution of those plans and those strategies. However, I think we can break down the barrier between micro and macro and make execution just that much easier. Why do I believe this topic is important? There is a narrative in the League of Legends community that mechanics are important to climb and you either have it or you don't. I want to challenge this notion a little bit. I think it's even more important for individuals who are analytically minded. So I have a lot of experience working with these types of players by now. I see myself as that type of player as well. These are people who prefer to operate within the world of structure and of order and having things go to plan and out strategizing their opponents. So you can bring your analysis and uh, planning to fights just as easily to macro. So on a macro level, you will try to out strategize your opponent, but on a micro level, you can do that just as easily. I know there are a lot of mental blocks out there. I've heard phrases like, I'm too old to play mechanical champs or to have good mechanics, I'm going to play enchanters and support, things like that, or I'm more of a macro player than a micro player. I'm better in the mid to late game and I struggle in the laning phase. This is a false narrative and it is completely in your mind. You can play these champions, you don't have to hold yourself back. You can formulate plans and strategies to execute on the micro and the macro level. I'm here to help break you free from your mental prison. Now one of the main dangers about talking about mechanics is phrases like he has better mechanics, he's just better. It is kind of alienating, right? It puts people on a pedestal, it's kind of like unreachable skill level that they have almost like talents that can't be changed, you can't improve on. It's similar to the phrase, you know, being built diff, you just can't ascend, you can't achieve what they achieve. And so then there's no point in putting any thought or effort into improving mechanics at all if it's not within the realm of improvement. But you definitely can get better at mechanics just like you can get better at wave management. All it takes is just potentially rephrasing the word from mechanics to execution or to strategizing. If we compare the phrases, he has better mechanics versus he has a better strategy, one of them seems a lot more achievable than the other. Let's talk about why mechanics is a myth now. And so I've already mentioned that I believe that you can apply strategy and analysis to plays, to execution just as much to macro movements. And I wanna start off this section with a quote from the Shy. This is a famous professional uh, top player he was the world's champion in 2018 and he was widely regarded as the best player in the world at that time. And so he was interviewed and what he said was that people say I'm a mechanical player, but I feel because I already have the idea planned out, I'm more of a theory player. He continues, I have it all crafted out in my mind, but I get that the fans see that as mechanical, but it's more than just mechanics, it's more tactical thoughts. So I really resonate with this perspective. In my own pro days, I was feel oriented, I was lacking cohesive plans, I was just trying to dance in the chaos and improvise. I didn't have great strategies, I didn't have, you know, cohesive structures in place and so then I just kind of winged it. And since then I've really refined my gameplay through pretty subpar solo queue practice, no scrims, no full time gaming house, even a higher ping to the height of my pro career. I feel like my level of play is objectively much, much better. And this is all through deliberate structuring. So on the topic of my pro days, I think something that is pretty important to mention is that people very rarely reviewed micro and mechanics. It was easy to talk about draft. It was easy to talk about macro play, about you know team uh, coordinating plans together. But actually reviewing micro, reviewing skirmishes, reviewing fights was pretty foreign of a concept. And again, this ties into placing mechanics in a realm that is unreachable. You know, it's just talent. It doesn't matter how much you practice, you either have it or you don't. But since then I've placed a heavy emphasis on reviewing both micro and macro. And so if any of what I'm saying is resonating with you and you feel like you're more analytically minded and you really want that structure, review your fights. You can improve your laning, you can improve your skirmishing. And it all comes down to strategizing and creating structures for you to use. So I wanna talk about chaos and order now. 
chaos is the unknown, the unstructured, anything can happen, versus order, it's the structured, it's the comfortable, the predictable, the reliable. The more we operate in the world of order, the more comfortable we are with everything, including executing those plays. It won't even feel like having to execute a play, it's already pre-planned in your head. So for the shy, I believe he is operating almost exclusively in the world of order, or he was operating in the world of order much more than other players. Let's imagine a random gold top laner versus the shy, okay? A trade happens between them. The gold player will only be thinking zero or one steps ahead, going with the flow, seeing what happens, and not being able to quantify why something worked or didn't work out. The shy, on the other hand, knew why he wanted to take that trade, knew how the trade should go, knew how to maximize uh, the chances of success in that trade, knew what would happen if the trade wasn't accepted by his opponent, creating win-win situations, knew on a larger scale why this trade is important for the game, etc. All before the trade even occurs. This is strategizing, this is planning, this is game knowledge. And so then the trade goes in his favor. Is he more talented? Is he more mechanical? Or is he just a better strategist? The gold player loses a trade and then he might say, oh man, the champion that the Shy is playing is just OP or I got unlucky. Or on the other hand, he could say, the Shy is just way too good. There's no way I can ever reach that level. He's just insanely talented or mechanically gifted. And these potential narratives would not be helpful at all for the gold player to be able to improve. A more helpful response would be exactly why did this go in his favor? And then kind of peeling back layers, really trying to figure out why this happened and why the Shy wanted this to happen. And this is obviously much easier said than done. If you don't know what to look for, then you won't find what you need. But we are going to talk about how to reach a higher level of order in your games. So we talked about operating in order being important and operating in the world of order is going to vastly minimize the pressure for execution. You know what you want to do, you know what the enemy is likely to do, you know how they're going to react on a micro level, on a macro level. You know how to just maximize the chances of success and make it almost a numbers game. And making it a numbers game by, you know, finding these win-win situations. Okay, so the world, but you know, just the League of Legends universe for this video is, you know, organized into chaos and order. And how do we get more of the world in order. How can we be comfortable and confident and understand everything that is going on? Well, for this, we need to expand our boundary of order into chaos, into the unknown by living in that space, living on the edge between order and chaos. So the shy, he found his knowledge through playing many, many champs, testing limits, making plays, inting, learning, expanding his order, t order territory into the unknown. Now he's comfortable in those previously murky waters, and he's made those murky wa waters habitable for him. So now it's no longer chaos, it's order for him, whereas it's still uninhabitable for most of us. And so we want to be comfortable being uncomfortable. And what does this really mean? This means feeling order in chaos, and then less and less of your gameplay will be reliant on execution, on mechanics, it's all strategy. The only way to push the boundaries of order is by testing your limits. And so this is going to tie into a phrase that I like to repeat a lot, especially to my students, where you should be more afraid of missing opportunities than of making mistakes. Because if you're just sitting back playing safe and you don't want to make mistakes, which is natural, but it's not going to be conducive to improving, to expanding your order territory. If you make mistakes, you test those limits, you learn from them, you integrate them into your repertoire, become better and better and slowly build up on your knowledge and then, then there's no reason why you couldn't end up almost operating exclusively in a world of order. So to give a visual of this, let's just say we're in a really tough matchup bot and we don't really know what to expect, um, but we're not going to try it out. We're not going to play aggressive and see what the enemy uh, bot lane can or can't do. We're just going to take the safe option and just chill. And then we're not gonna learn. We're not gonna learn if we do need to respect them or not. We're not gonna learn damage limits. We're not going to learn uh, you know, potential interactions or the identity of that bot lane, we're just going to make an assumption. And so this can apply to any area that you find yourself uncomfortable with. If you're not sure about something, test it, put it to the test, learn from it. Could it cost you your lane? Definitely. Could it cost you that game? Definitely. But this is where the long-term student mindset is exceptionally important. This one game isn't going to mean anything in the grand scheme of things. You should be trying to become the best player and person that you possibly can so that every game that is in front of you, you are best equipped to deal with it. 
So I want to give you guys an example of mechanics being a myth and we're going to start with a Nautilus game on my uh, Challenger account. And so this is the start of the lane. I am pressuring from the mid bush. I know that I can achieve a lot from being in fog in here. And then the enemy Soraka is eventually going to walk up in the lane and she's going to look for a Q, but I'm already going to be moving backwards to dodge it. And this isn't some, you know, insane dodge from me reacting to her throwing it out. I know that she wants to walk up and look for a Q because from her perspective, she knows that the Nautilus, you know, is in this bush and she wants to try and cue the bush so that, you know, she can relieve some pressure, she can poke me out and then I'm ready to dodge it. Again, it's all pre-planned. I could even be posturing on the back side of this bush and not even have to click away whatsoever. Okay, so I dodge the Soraka's Q and then I walk forwards to try and dodge the Israel Q because I know that he knows that I just dodged downwards, right? And so now I'm going to be unpredictable and move upwards. And so I'm not like reacting again. I'm not, this isn't talent. This is just understanding their perspective and what they are going to likely look to do with their skill shots. And so now they both use their Q, right? The Soraka missed her Q, the Israel just missed his Q. And this gives me some confidence to walk up because they don't have any spells, right? So this is just eliminating the risk of me getting poked out by walking up on this window because they literally have no spells. So kind of playing the numbers game here. Okay, so I precisely pick my moment to walk up and start pressuring. And now comes my cue. So I'm not going to walk up and then instantly look to throw the hook because what he could do is look to move behind his minions so that the minions block my cue. So we'll just have a look at it again. They miss their spells. And now what I could do is just try to run forward and then quickly throw out a cue, but he can move over here, right? You can see his movement, his body language is suggestive of he's going to look for this exit route, this way to dodge my cue. But I'm not going to throw out my hook. I've been in that situation before. I'm not going to fall for it. I have an idea of how to maximize the chance of my cue landing without needing pretty much any talent or any skill whatsoever. I'm not going to throw it out instantly. I want him to juke around. I want to feel out his, his body language a little bit. I want him to show his hand and then eventually I'm going to throw out that hook. And so the way that I'm going to throw out my hook is I'm going to throw for a slight juke. Now this is not perfectly aiming my Q so that it hits him if he doesn't juke or if he does juke, you know, I'm not perfectly dissecting that middle line. I'm not re getting really granular aiming at a pixel. This is just body language. This is just, you know, player behaviors. I know that a Nautilus hook is pretty scary and it is very, very unlikely that a player is just going to completely disregard it and try to run away to safety without trying to dodge it. So then the, the hook hits and then we get a chunk and then we get to be in, in a really good spot in the 2v2 lane. Now there is an element of adapting in the game, of course. I didn't load into this game knowing exactly what was going to happen. I did adapt to them, you know, using their skill shots. I did adapt to Israel's uh, movements. I waited for him to move a little bit. But this is just game knowledge and this is just strategizing. Now is this some crazy formula, you know, that I'm calculating in my head in the moment? Absolutely not. It is all but integrated into my muscle memory at this stage through trial and error, through experience, through paying attention to what happens and why it happens in my games. And the same exact thing can happen with you. Okay, next example. And again, this is a challenger game. And we're going to have a look at another example of landing a skill shot. And so here I'm just sprinting forwards at her and then I instantly throw out a cue and I'm predicting a juke. And again, this is just, you know, knowledge of behavioral patterns. And so if I'm just going to run forwards, I think it is very unlikely that just kind of running towards a person and throwing out a skill shot, there won't be any jukes at all. There's a possibility if we play the mind game out, if I'm kind of holding my cue, posturing, lining her up, then she kind of starts to play that game and then maybe she'll start to be unpredictable. But if I immediately just run forwards and throw a skill shot, I think it is very likely that she's going to juke in some capacity. And now, of course, there's going to be some baseline level of execution, right? You want to be able to actually uh, throw out your skill shot to hit them if they juke. But that is much, much more manageable to just hit them if they juke than it is to perfectly aim your skill shot, you know, pixel perfect every time. And so I'm pretty much trying to do everything in my power to relieve the pressure of execution. Maximizing the chance of success and minimizing risk. Now on the point of micro and of skill shots, we can apply the same concepts with dodging skill shots. We want to try to be unpredictable to disrupt their strategy and we can plan it out in the head and we can kind of know you know general tendencies of how people are going to use skill shots and so dodging skill shots this is going to require more apm this is going to require a little bit more clicking and it'll be a little bit harder to like physically execute i suppose but it can still completely operate 
within the realm of strategy and game knowledge. And so this is when I was playing uh, Ziggs ADC on my Master's Smurf, so still high elo. And then I'm going to dodge the Seraphine Q by being unpredictable, by juking forwards, which is definitely not something that uh, would be expected from the Seraphine. And so I dodge that, and then we're going to skip forwards a little bit here. I'm going to end up under tower in a 1v3 dive. And then on the back end here, I'm going to dodge the Jin W just by moving up. And then I'm going to try and dodge the Javan Eki, which might look impossible, right? But I kind of know when is the best chance for me to look to dodge it. Or if I was in the Javan shoes, when would I be comfortable in throwing out that skill shot? And so sometimes it's not enough to be unpredictable. You want to be unpredictably unpredictable. And so I'm just going to play it out without any commentary and you have a look and think if you can kind of understand why I moved how I did, as opposed to Jarvan just looks like he's completely whiffing the skill shot for no reason. Okay, here we go. Okay, so let's have a look at that. And so I know that Jarvan wants to look to EQ. I know that he wants to, he'll be comfortable looking to EQ when I have kind of committed towards a path. If I have shown my hand and juking in one direction, then he can look to throw it that way. But if I'm unpredictably unpredictable, if I'm going to look for a juke and then cancel that juke and then juke around a little bit more and just be really almost erratic with my movements, then it can be very hard for him to land this EQ. And so I'm pretending like I am running this way so that he will feel comfortable in throwing it, but then I'm going to juke back unpredictably towards the wall and dodge that on the edge. And then obviously I still die, but in terms of dodging skill shots, this is obviously the main point for this uh, clip. So I know in his mind that he wants to maximize the chances of hitting his EQ and I led him into a false sense of security and I didn't necessarily react at all to his actual skill shot. I was just being unpredictable. And then once he committed to it, then that's the highest chance that I can give myself of actually dodging the skill shot. It was the same with the Seraphine Q. I didn't necessarily react to the particles leaving her and where they were going to travel. I was just being unpredictable. Because I know from their perspective what their champs, first of all, what their abilities do and what they want to do. I know Seraphine wants to look to poke from range and so I'm going to move forward so that it's a bit of an unfamiliar situation for her. I know that Jarvan wants to look to find a window to EQ. And I know this all from experience, from playing the champs myself, from playing against these champs a lot, from just watching these champions perform and trying to figure out solutions to problems, you know, reviewing skirmishes. The last example I'm going to show is pretty much a combination between game knowledge and fast clicks. And so I saw that uh, Cassio just walked into fog and I know that she could be sitting in this bush. And I know that Cassios like to sit in bushes and look to find alts uh, to find a pick. And so I'm going to pretend like I'm just running straight forward in a line like I'm disrespecting and maybe she'll throw out her alts. I'm going to juke back. I'm going to be unpredictable with my movements. I'm going to throw out my cue. I'm not satisfied with checking the bush with just my cue. Although I might just be pretending like I'm satisfied with uh, her not being in this bush now, but I'm still going to be unpredictable. I'm going to be unpredictable, unpredictable, and then I kind of get her ult out. And so from her perspective, we can just watch that. Cassio sits in bush, sees a Rakan, sees a Rakan throw, throw the Q out, and then suggestive body language that he might run in, and then feels like they can get a pick with the ult. The last point that I want to quickly touch on is easy to execute champs in low elo and why that is generally recommended. And I believe that it is because of unsophisticated strategies, not ne necessarily mechanical execution. You just don't have to make sophisticated strategies. You don't have to be two, three, four, five steps ahead. You can be zero steps ahead. You don't need to have a plan to figure out exactly the best way to land your abilities, etc. You can kind of just do whatever is immediately in front of you and you won't get punished as much as other champions. And so piloting these champions can help you learn the game so that you can develop more sophisticated strategies and then you can eventually expand or rotate your champion pool. And so again, of course there is such a thing as execution, but with a comprehensive strategy, we don't need to rely on this. So how comprehensive is your strategy? The more precisely you have strategized, the more game knowledge you have accrued throughout your League of Legends career, the more you know about player tendencies, this all makes it easier to actually execute strategies. Personally, I don't even think I am mechanically gifted, whatever that means. I'm just trying to play chess. I do not rely on reaction time or necessarily precise clicks. I'm making a preformed decision and seeing if it plays out. I am making consistently high percentage plays. A lot of other pros are as well, and I believe that you can too. 
This is a complex topic that is hard to cover in a relatively short video, and this is also a perspective that I am encouraging you to adopt, not necessarily stating objective facts. So I would love to hear what you all think of mechanics and how it interacts with gaming, with League of Legends. Please let me know down below. Continuing with my South Island trip, I did the Rocky Summit and Diamond Lake hike, and this is still in the Wanaka region. And as usual, there's a beautiful start to the hike. Even the car park looks really nice with the mountains in the background. And here we can see um, this is where the Diamond Lake viewpoint was. And so this is a pretty manageable hike initially. It's very common. Uh, I saw a lot of people hiking this. And we can see why the Diamond Lake gets its name here with its shape. And what happens after this hike is you can choose to go on to do the Rocky Summit, which is much harder, much longer. And so this was some of the photos from the top of the hike. Now, there was incredible winds that were happening near the top. I couldn't wear my hat or my earphones and we're gonna see a little bit of footage here. So uh, sorry to your eyes for having to see this, but it was incredibly windy. And honestly, I had so much fun on this hike. The sun, the wind, the mountains, I was so happy at the top here, just being at one with nature. It's always one of the highlights of my hikes to have conversations with strangers and meet people from around the world. And so I met a couple of tourists from America and a mountain uh, lover from Switzerland. And we had a couple of uh, deep chats, which is, which is awesome. And because of how many hikes I had been doing, I had a sore knee on my left leg and blisters on my right foot. And I had to choose between uh, which leg I was going to emphasize my weight on on my run down the mountain, which I thought was pretty funny, but I chose uh, external injury rather than the internal one. Next up I did Roy's Peak hike and this was a great view of Wanaka. Um, as you can see there that's the town of Wanaka that is where I was staying and then I climbed up over here and here's Wanaka Lake. So this was a very challenging hike. I loved every minute. It was a hot day. It was a very long hike. I think around 16 kilometers. I had a vision of myself climbing higher and higher mountains in the future. I just loved slowly climbing up and up and I could kind of relate this to playing league in a way. It inspired me to keep climbing and improving and to trust that uh, if I just stick to the process, the results will all be worth it in the end. It was a beautiful view. <laughs> and we climbed up very high. As you can see, we're pretty much in the mountain peaks here. And down here, we can see where the car park is. So obviously a very long and arduous climb and it was pretty much through farmland. Now this isn't unusual at all for New Zealand. Uh, hiking through farmland and seeing farm animals but the sheep were pretty much right on the track and I thought it was just worth showing you guys. Thanks for watching. Please consider liking and subscribing if you enjoyed. Big thank you to all of my Patreons over here. I really couldn't do this without you. Um, the links for coaching, for Patreon, for my School of Support Discord server, for socials, they're all going to be linked in the description below. Any and all support is greatly appreciated. I am streaming five days a week now at twitch.tv slash cupcakeoce. Come say hi, I would love to see you there.